Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another 6-5 podcast. Both Daniel and I are videoing here from an undisclosed location. Um, Bunker? Yeah, maybe. I mean, my, mine might have something to do with horses, and I might be in Florida. Uh, Daniel, how about you? You, you? you must be in a like a five-star hotel or something. I'm in a hotel that has a star. Let's just put it that way, and it's not five. Well, um, listen, two stars is better than one. Three is better than two. I uh, had a pretty good night's sleep. Gosh, been on the road for I think, three weeks now, and I'm a little tired. Uh, you and I went to uh, a couple shows uh, together. That was uh, that was pretty nice. But we're back, man. We are. We, a, uh, we took a little bit of a, a little bit of a break, right? Took a week, took a week long break, but uh, we're back, and we're bad. And by the way, if it's the first time you're joining us uh we cover you know six topics uh run about uh, 40 minutes um but uh we're Sometimes all a little bit of news so well you know you know, you, you, you know uh we did the summit and that was a killer run and then we actually did our weekly pod the week of the summit and then due to some travel the week after we had to take a, a friday off came back this week no slowdown, no rest for the weary, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, we're we're hauling, we're cranking. And, you know, there's just so much to talk about in tech. Um, quick, uh, you know, disclosure, this show is for information and entertainment purposes only. While we are talking about publicly traded companies, please don't take anything that Patrick or I say as investment advice. We just want to always make sure we get that out of the way. Um, and I'll uh, revert back hosting duties now, but uh, we got a good show. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we're going to be talking Cisco, Amazon, Lenovo, Splunk. Qualcomm and a little bit of Oracle. You know, Daniel, it just seems like the news has just come out like a uh, like a fire hose. It's uh, it's it, it's pretty it's pretty crazy. But hey, let's uh, let's jump into Cisco Live, uh, a show that you attended. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I had to do it uh, virtually, but a um, lot of a lot of great stuff coming out of it. Yeah, Pat, absolutely. So Cisco Live was another big week. Um, had a lot of topics, a lot of introductions, uh, you know, whether it was the remote work uh, revolution, security, uh, application monitoring. This was a show where, first of all, Chuck Robbins got on stage, very excited to basically be back in a physical space with people. Um, I thought they did a pretty good job of trying to keep, uh, uh, you know, everybody safe. But at the same time, uh, getting a large group. That was the largest group I'd been with yet, Pat. So, you know, we did IBM Think with 500 people. This was probably more like 5,000 people. So a big room, big stage, a lot of things being focused on. You know, a couple of things I thought, uh, you know, was was really in, in interesting about the company is one is you got a full sense that the, the remote uh, or slash hybrid work is going to be at the epicenter of Cisco. But the hybrid work discourse or conversation or debate or whatever we want to call it is shifting because in the beginning, hybrid work was all about collaboration apps. It was just about basically how do we get people on video? But what Cisco, I think, is identified as an opportunity, and you're seeing this through that whole stack of things they're working on, endpoint security, observability, uh, the WebEx integration updates, is they're trying to really think about how do we tie together a hybrid work experience that takes into consideration connectivity? networking, um, application performance, runtime and uptime takes into consideration, um, you know, the branch office and how people stay connected. So there was a lot of focus on innovations at Cisco Live that enabled that. Um, also, you know, another thing I thought was pretty interesting was uh, their updates to the U learning platform. Anybody that knows much about the Cisco's history knows uh, how important the CCIE and the different certifications were early on in creating this extraordinary dedication between Cisco's consumers, meaning the enterprises that bought Cisco, and the brand. Well, over time, as the consumption has changed, as public cloud has grown up, as people have moved from being Cisco certified to being AWS and Azure and other certifications that have become in vogue, that the weight of the Cisco certification has fallen a little bit. So the company has been focusing on trying to turn that around and their U learning platform um, is really, you know, about accelerating, about creating a bigger stream of inbound and skilled professionals that are going to learn to build on Cisco. Um, and I think that's going to be something that's really important for the company because getting that kind of loyalty back, um, 
they're seeing their business model change, Pat. And so, uh, it, you know, for instance, one other for instance is, you know, we all knew the attached maintenance on every piece of Cisco hardware had been a great model for Cisco for a long time. But in the consumption uh, economy, that model is shifting and companies don't want to pay an extra maintenance on every piece of hardware that they're purchasing. Cisco's reinventing, it's rethinking its business model. It's something that's going to be a continuation. Um, and I guess I'll say one other thing, because I know I saw your article on the, the WebEx stuff. So I'm going to give you, I'm not going to take too much of that platform because I want to leave you some oxygen on that one. But I did think the uh, Cisco, uh, Liz and Tony and the leadership of Cisco really made a clear statement that they're going all in on observability. Uh, we'll talk more about Splunk later because I was also at .com this, this last week, but um, they almost bought Splunk. And, you know, that was in the news because it was a real thing. They didn't yeah. buy Splunk, but, you know, with their portfolio, with, with AppD, with a number of their different application monitoring services, um, Cisco is going all in on a full scale observability suite. Um, and that's something that, you know, with the App Dynamics Cloud, with their Thousand Eyes, um, you know, basically putting this all together, they're offering what's called App Dynamics Cloud Solution. And I think, uh, you know, taking full telemetry, full data, offering full stack observability is going to be a hot topic. It still needs a lot of definition, Pat, but that was something that the company definitely leaned into. So like I said, across the board, there's that. The other biggest thing is hybrid work and the WebEx offerings, but I'm going to hand that to you. No, I appreciate that. So uh, first off, I uh, appreciated uh, Chuck reinforcing basically the four things you should be focusing on, which by the way, were the same things they talked about the last two years. So it's good to think, good to see consistency and you know, when it comes to the enterprise, I think strategic consistency is uh, is is important. Uh, but but let me hit some highlights. Uh, you know, G two uh, came in. Uh, he runs not only WebEx but also uh, security, and he suggested this vision where you uh, separate security and networking from everything else, and and brought up this idea of a um, of a security cloud, um, which. Uh, what was interesting uh, was new, hard for me to uh, poke holes in it, uh, but I think in the end, probably good for customers and obviously good for, uh, for, for Cisco. Uh, then uh, Todd Nightingale, you know, the highlights uh, uh, from his talk is really, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, Maraca-fying uh, catalyst, right? So in, in the Cisco world, right, you had Meraki, which is cloud, Right, they're number one in um, in uh, cloud managed networks. Then you have Cisco Catalyst, which is number one in networking. But the challenge with Catalyst, uh, quite frankly, it, it was it's hard to use. Right, um, uh, requires special training, and by putting this together, really put um, an exclamation point on uh, where Todd started, which says, "Hey." You know, for years we delivered powerful capabilities, but it was just way too hard, way too complex. And I did appreciate um, uh, Todd acknowledging that Cisco had delivered complex systems uh, because that's exactly uh, what they've done. They've been powerful, but they have been um, they've been uh, very uh, 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 complex. And you know, kind of with an exclamation point on on Thousand Eyes, listen. Observability is is paramount, and every enterprise needs to be jumping into it. And whether you want to call it uh, full stack observability end to end, the amount of complexity is increasing. The uh, bifurcation of ownership of all the different points that drive an application um, need to be monitored. And then you know you can imagine the next step on here is is the AI capability to um, uh, make changes uh, before they ha before something goes wrong, right? That really is the kind of holy grail, and I like to call that the, the, autonomous, uh, the autonomous enterprise. So net-net, a lot of stuff to, a lot of interesting stuff coming out of, uh, of uh, Cisco Live. And uh, Daniel, let's uh, move on to uh, the next topic, which is Amazon Remars. So, you and I spent, gosh, two and a half days there, which is uh, a, a, a pretty big commitment. And um, what an exciting show. I mean, what does Mars stand for? So first of all, it, uh, the show was put on by Amazon and AWS. 
And Mars is essentially machine learning, uh, automation, uh, and AI. The R is robotics, and the S is space. And I can't think of uh, two more exciting topics to uh, get into. But you know, Daniel is just a cornucopia of 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 geek. We got the chance to talk to the leaders from pretty much, I think, every one of the groups except for uh, except for uh, robotics and. You know, you can read my stuff on Forbes. I cranked out another another article last night about it. You can read my tweet stream, but I want to look at more of the bigger picture. Also, then, our pods, man. Huh? We're gonna oh, have a whole bunch of yeah, yeah, we'll have four pods coming out as soon as our um, as soon as our editors can can get it out. But uh, net net Mars, this is the next generation of technology. I think it's it's very clear to say that Amazon is is the leader in digital uh, e-commerce with amazon.com they are the number one market share leader in IaaS and PaaS for the cloud but it's like what's next right and and to me this is an expression to investors this is expression to potentially people who they can hire this is their way of getting in on the next generation opportunities uh, out there and and by the way, I, you know, also I think in many ways can be good for society, right? We saw technologies like uh, BCI that uh, can help people who don't know how to communicate to communicate. People who can't walk learn how to walk. Uh, in space, the ability to uh, have data uh, and and process it. By the way, inside of uh, of the ISS that that can help people. Uh, know uh, when there's a forest fire uh, within three minutes of it happening in Brazil to be able to uh, uh, stamp that out. So uh, a lot of content, uh, a great show, uh, Daniel. Um, yeah, what'd you think about it? Yeah, you hit it on the head, Pat. Um, you know, I couldn't help the shameless plug for our, our shows, 6-5 on the road at Remars. We had a lot of fun, um, you know, talking... Pat, by the way, this is, you know, what I loved most about Remars is it just let us talk about things that at a different level, a different, yeah. you know, call it maybe a different altitude, which is appropriate, um, than how we typically talk about it. Like putting a snow cone in space. We talk about edge a lot. We talk about connectivity, IoT, networking. But the idea that basically you're going to build a cloud in space that's going to look and feel a lot like the cloud we've built here on Earth uh, is pretty neat. It's pretty unique. Or the idea of how, you know, AI and ML is used in uh, collaboration with neuroscience to create a brain-computer interface that allows someone that, that deals with severe paralysis and is no longer able to speak or communicate using traditional methods to now be able to communicate with the world. I mean, it's pretty mind-boggling. I mean, you know, an inch away from telepathy, right? The idea that our brains can still function, communicate. And there's people working on these really hard problems, these really interesting and hard challenges that our society face, um, and not just hyper focusing on you know sort of some of the day to day things that, by the way, I love, but I like to sometimes get out of my comfort zone. So, learning about lower Earth orbit uh, space exploration and the fact that Amazon Blue Origin uh, is already working on developing and by the way pre selling the the ability yeah. for people that want to to get to space. I mean, um, space is kind of becoming cool again. It's certainly controversial, but it's becoming cool again. But I like, you know, they talked about things like extinction events, and I know that nobody wants to talk about that because it's negative. But, you know, the idea that we want to talk about uh, sustainability all the time, climate, but we don't want to really talk about the fact that we continue to populate at a, at a you know, somewhat breakneck pace, and we don't really know what the capacity of our world is. You know, you got a company like like these that they're not just Amazon, but the companies they're working with, looking to actually try to solve that. You know, where do we put people when we've hit the edge of the the resources that this particular planet can offer? You know, and I think the question during that first keynote, Pat, was: Is it 15 billion people? You know, I think we have seven, eight on the Earth right now. Is it 10? How far are we away from the point where there is no more capacity? So these are the things that, like I said, for me, I don't know. Um, as, a, as an avid and continuous learner, someone that never wants to be at the end of my rope um, right. that I really enjoyed. The sit downs that we had, 
Uh, and then, by the way, some of the just the pragmatic launches. You had some great shares yes this week, Pat, on LinkedIn about some of the you know the code coding capabilities um, that AWS announced. Um, Hey, let's do a uh, shameless plug for uh, this interview that we did with uh, Clint Crozier. Oh, so, so good. Yeah, so I'm really excited about uh, all four uh, of the pods that we did there. But uh, this is uh, Clint, who runs uh, AWS's space and satellite business, him holding an AWS snow cone, uh, which, by the way, we, we couldn't say um, the day of, but the day after we were allowed to say that, hey, along with Axiom, this is an actual picture of a snow cone being used inside of the International uh, Space Station. And I can't think of anything more impressive uh, and that defines edge computing than, than something like this. But yeah, sorry, sorry for the uh, interruption there, though, but, but, you know, a real highlight there. And yeah, no, and I mean, I was even like looking... You know, thinking about like our conversation with Broughton about just the abilities to, and it, you know how everybody right now we use when we're using like whether it's Google or or Microsoft Word, and you know they, we can have our sentences fit. Well, now we're doing that for coding. AWS is doing that right. for machine learning, where you know you can actually help coders code faster by using machine learning to train coders and train code to move quicker. Just a lot of cool things. So we could talk about a lot more, Pat, but there's some very practical things. Oh yeah, talk about practical. I mean, Michael McKenzie, uh, the interview, he's uh, AWS GM of Industrial IoT and Edge. His grasp of, of kind of what it's gonna take to accelerate the industrial IoT, 100% uh, spot on. You know, so much that they're actually building hardware modules at uh, AWS to put on um, engine parts to, do, to help do uh, predictive maintenance. So anyways, exciting stuff, uh, exciting stuff, Daniel. Anything else you wanted to add to uh, to Remars? No, basically, uh, you know, keep your head in the clouds, and uh, you know, all is good. But yeah, no, was, stay, uh, no, stay tuned. Our video should be out, and I'm um, hope hopefully on Monday. Yeah, so, let's do that. Really super excited about that. Rock. So, Daniel, let's uh, move to the next topic. Uh, Swank had their big annual conference called Dot Conf, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, I. You know, same uh, same week as uh, Cisco Live in the same city, and uh, I wasn't there for Cisco Live, and I wasn't there for Splunk. So uh, why don't you why don't you kick this one off? Well, you were there in heart. You know, you were there in heart. You know, because I sat down with CEO Gary Steele at their news desk, and it was a six five on the road. And every once in a while, the bestie crew were like the other besties. The better besties were the better besties. No man, I don't think it was a six five on the road, baby. I think it was. I think he went solo. I think it was a. It's kind of like uh, it was supposed to be you and I, and it was very last minute, and then it wasn't, and then it was. But my point was, it was sort of marketed that way. It just isn't. It was kind of like at MWC when I was laying flat, vertical, uh, horizontal on my back with uh, the 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 whatever virus that goes around every year. Uh, sometimes we cover for each other, but the point uh, that I was making is they wanted the six five there. Let's yeah. just put it that way. Doesn't everybody, Pat, want the six five? Well, their- I think that's our goal. I mean, my gosh, I mean, what we cooked this idea up uh, three years ago, uh, third years, uh, third year of the uh, the conference. I mean, 70, uh, 75 speakers, 25 CEOs. I mean, out of this world, buddy, is straight out to Mars. But no, the uh, the the fact is I had a great chance to sit down with their new CEO, Gary Steele, who's really getting acclimated to the, the role into the chair. Interesting moment for Splunk.com because over the last couple of years, Splunk has been in what I would consider to be a major business transformation. You're talking about a company that had moved all of its efforts from a traditional ingestion-based monitoring and um, for IT SecOps and uh, IT ops to a full stack observability focused 100% on recurring revenue and moving and migrating customers to the cloud. So that's been the company's multi-year goal. They've also had a pretty significant leadership transition. Not only has Gary Steele came in for Doug Merritt as CEO, but we saw major roles pretty much across the entire senior management has changed. You know, this, so that's you know what I would say as a company in transition. What's interesting, though, is despite a lot of, of uncertainty, transition, new leadership, um, and having some decent competition, you know, IBM's investing in observability, acquired a, in Stana. You saw what Cisco is doing around observability. 
all the public cloud providers are, are offering varying levels of observability, application performance management. Splunk is actually, you know, and, and you, by the way, you spoke at a Logic Monitor event. They're doing some interesting things in this space, but somehow Splunk has sort of kept itself as a kind of uniquely best of breed as seen as for their observability. They have almost the entire fortune <laughs> using their, their products. Their growth of million dollar customers, uh, subscription customers is growing extremely quickly. Um, and they've been able to keep that reputation. But at the same time, you also saw some vulnerabilities. I mean, like I said, they almost, I believe, no one knows for sure, but I believe there was almost a deal to be done. And Splunk was almost taken uh, you know, with, into another company during the, this kind of interesting market time. So at the event itself, though, I guess the reason I kind of point all these external factors out is it wasn't a big announcement event, which is historically what .conf has been. It's been announcements. Yeah. This event was more what I call a reassurance event. It was the opportunity after multi years of not getting face to face with customers to have a heavy duty dose of in person interactions with this new leadership team, with this new business model to reconnect and create confidence in the market that the Splunk strategy is in fact going to work. And so having spent some time with Gary Steele, learning about uh, the business and also having spent time, by the way, he spoke at our 65 Summit, I'm starting to see this guy gets it. He, he comes from a background of working with companies that are in a similar size, taking them public. He's also been in the process of taking companies private. I don't get the sense that that's what Splunk's looking to do here, but obviously everything's on the table if market dynamics get weird enough. Um, in terms of the big focus though, it was basically one, and that was really this general availability of this Splunk Enterprise 9. Um, so if I turn the direction just to kind of on a product side, that was the big thing. That's the big focus. It's it's the uh, 9.0 release, and it's really getting people to the Splunk uh, platform. And if you don't hear this word platform enough, they, just like every other company on the planet, gets that you don't win business by selling features. You don't win business by selling, um, you know, uh, uh, software in a vacuum. You have to have an extensible platform, Pat. I feel like you and I had a conversation the other night. I can't remember what it was exactly about, but I remember we talked about essentially the difference between features that became companies during this last wave of growth and companies yeah. that are going to grow and become successful in the long term are the companies that have figured out how to grow from having one kind of killer app or one thing that people are buying to having a platform that people are building on. And so that's the big opportunity for Splunk. That's also the big question. Release nine, their cloud migration and their subscription consumption model gives them more depth there. But I see a lot of competition coming and they've got a lot of work to do to stay seen as the leader in the observability space. Listen, observability is hot, hot, and, 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 and more hot. And the reason is, is because the complexity and the bifurcation of, of every piece of an application is spread all over the place, right? Uh, it's not just, you know, the good old days where you had on-prem and then you built your application and then people came in. And now you you have resources, uh, IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, different APIs, multiple APIs. You need to figure out what the heck is, is going on. Then you've got devices, right? You have multiple devices uh, that are out there. You have smartphones, you have tablets, you have PCs, um, and you have to be monitoring your, your infrastructure. So it is a complex world. And I, I think all I'm doing there is establishing the market case for observability. Uh, but but listen, there there is an incredible amount of, of competition there. And I do think that, um, that Splunk is at a, at a crossroads where um, what, what got them to the game is not necessarily what's going to take them to, to that next step. Um, you know, CEO Gary Steele, he hasn't been in the, um, he hasn't been in the chair long enough, I think for, for him to, you know, uh, bring the tablets uh, off there. But listen, there's a reason he's in that space uh, and that there was a CEO change. The board was obviously looking for something different. So, there is change coming. Uh, the The conference just wasn't the place uh, to do it. But I mean, you have you have companies like Logic Monitor. You have New Relic. Uh, you have Startup uh, Observe that's uh, sitting on the back of uh, Snowflake. You have some of the more traditional uh, companies like Dynatrace uh, out there. There are a lot of people uh, coming uh, for uh, for this company. 
One of the benefits that I see from a value standpoint, Daniel, is some of the traditional on-prem um, infrastructure folks, the HPEs, the Dells, folks like that, I see a huge opportunity for acquisition uh, of some of these observation companies. Why? It gets them into the game of monetizing the public cloud and SaaS where they really weren't doing that, uh, uh, really weren't doing that before. But listen, uh, I look forward to actually meeting Gary. Uh, you've got the jump uh, on me uh, on that. And I'd love to uh, go to one of their events uh, coming up. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're going to get the 6.5 in there and truly the 6.5, which isn't ever really a thing if it's not the both of us, buddy. So listen, I, I'm, I, am, I am on it. This is on me, but this is an interesting space. It is. It is for sure. Uh, speaking of interesting, let's let's move to uh, Lenovo. Lenovo, a company that absolutely uh, is crushing it from a, uh, a a growth standpoint. So uh, years ago, uh, Lenovo bought the assets of IBM's uh, server and networking business and a little bit of storage that uh, uh, that was in there. And um, uh, Kirk Scougen, uh, ex Intel. Uh, leader has been there for nearly six years, which I, I just consider a complete uh, uh, turnaround. I mean, you know, some highlights uh, there, they were actually profitable, right? After years of, of, of losing money, uh, growth was at, uh, you know, 13%, uh, percent, which by the way, for hardcore infrastructure is, is, is pretty, pretty amazing. And some of the things that uh, Lenovo has been able to do that that none of the other infrastructure players have been able to do is they are actually a huge provider to the hyperscale uh, community and you know tier one and tier two. They've been able to do this through an ODM plus model and essentially they bridge the gap between ODM and and OEM. Managed to push out push a lot of folks traditional vendors out of the market and they're e even taking market share from ODMs, like, so how, you know, so it's a huge, uh, hugely unique and innovative. One of the ways you're doing it is unlike most traditional stuff, they actually have their own factories, 22 million square feet of factories. They do SMT uh, lines, they do final production. One of the largest manufacturers in Mexico, okay? And newsflash, uh, Lenovo is, is not just China business. They're about a third, a third, a third. Uh, North America, Western Europe, uh, and Asia. So they're not uh, even remotely uh, comparable to somebody like uh, a, a, a Huawei. And by the way, I can't talk. They gave us roadmaps. They gave us their future strategy. I'm actually looking at it right now. <laughs> I'd like to rattle it off, but uh, I signed an NDA uh, uh, going in there. But uh, super impressed uh, with what they're doing, um, you know, I've met with you know Ken Ken Wong uh, on the ISG side for uh, services. He runs the other division. He's a a peer with Kirk. You combine ISG um, um, with uh, sorry ISG with SSG the services group, and I think it's going to be a killer uh, combination uh, coming up. Watch Lenovo and storage, folks. Uh, they're crushing it on the server side. Uh, just wait to what you see in server. Sorry, in storage. Yeah, you know, Pat, you got to use your NDA as a cheat sheet to not have to say too much, but to tease everybody that there's a lot going on. Um, <laughs> what I like about Lenovo is that they're in so many different things, but they're not. I, it's like they are not ever me too. Yet at the same time, they're extraordinarily good at finding their niche. Yeah. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with a journalist yesterday about their true scale, for instance. And, you know, some companies right now that are trying to build out these on-prem cloud, which is still weird when I say it, but these consumption-based on-prem services for the future of hybrid cloud, they're really building this super vertical and horizontal software-based thing that's basically putting their um, users in a position where they're choosing, like, do I want to build on AWS or do I want to build on this container software? Do I want to use this uh, centralized platform for a control plane? 
Um, because, you know, the, as we see hybrid cloud come together, all these pieces, software has always ruled the roost. This is where VMware has had such a great advantage for such a long time, for instance, is VMware uh, has handled all the virtualization for basically every enterprise on the planet for the longest time. And even though Tanzu has been a mediocre product from, and again, this is more what I'm hearing. I don't use it every day. Just, um, and, you know, that's opened the door for things like OpenShift. VMware has been able to be very sticky there. Well, like if you look at TrueScale by Lenovo, uh, the way they're thinking about it is, we're not going to try to really compete at that software layer. We're going to compete on the fact that companies need to get their workloads into these hybrid cloud environments, and they want to pay for it in a consumption modality. They want a consumption mechanism to pay for this stuff. And we're going to make it super easy with the software that these people are already using. And so it's it's slightly different, yet it competes entirely. And yet they're able to carve out a niche because across this Lenovo portfolio, they have so many customers that are using their, their stuff, whether it's on the infrastructure side or it's on the PC side, that they're able to kind of create a stickiness. Kind of reminds me a little bit of how Dell has been so successful over the years, by the way, of just having this really great force of, of being able to attach more and more and more to every customer that uses their, their products. Um, I, I think the company's getting more and more innovative. I think it's becoming more and more confident. I think it's starting to find its its legs and its story as a higher value, higher service organization. Because I do think they've sort of done a really good job in that middle to lower opportunity of being differentiated, of being aggressive, of winning deals. Obviously, their margins are always a little smaller, huge top line numbers. The margins aren't always as big. But as their service portfolio grows, you're seeing that margin expand. And they've had some record numbers. I mean, the last few quarters, we've done the earnings here. You can go back and look at our earnings commentary. But... but I guess all I'm saying is as you sort of tie it together, I just continue to be impressed that Lenovo is just knows how to find where it fits in all these different markets and gets really good at it. And I give credit to people like Kirk, like uh, Matt Solinsky, like uh, Vlad, you know, who we work with. We get to work with a lot of their top executives and they're finding their way and they're creating more and more relevancy for Lenovo. And by the way, dealing with any of this sort of connotations with China in a really positive way where the company continues to grow, gain strength, gain confidence in the market and compete not just abroad, but here in the US and, uh, very strongly. So I wasn't there by the way. So I'm just uh, riffing cause you know, I have an opinion about everything, um, but we did have our analyst team there. And um, you know, what I can say is I do continue to be impressed by Lenovo. Yeah, you know, um, Susan Blocker is really uh, knocking it out uh, there uh, as well. and. You know, final thing that, that I want to just add on, on add on this is they really strike me as a company that they have an awareness problem, right? Wait, Lenovo makes storage? Oh, they do? Well, if you're in Asia, you probably know. Uh, if you're in North America, you probably don't. So that's a marketer's dream, right? When uh, the more you know me, the, the more you're going to love me. That means you have an awareness issue. And once you get the awareness taken care of, you can move them down. Uh, the funnel, but overall a great event. Daniel, let's move into an acquisition that uh, that the Qualcomm made. I mean, gosh, company on the move here. By the way, I love that you said that. Just uh, what you said about the more you know me, uh, you yeah. almost sounded like Bill McDermott in the recent interview. I did. I mean, he said almost the same thing. The only problem he has is if everyone knew him, the business would be this big. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, not everyone knows us. Um, yeah, so Qualcomm, um, you know, continues to expand. Uh, you know, the number one focus of the organization has been on getting clear market buy-in to its diversification strategy. Uh, CEO Christian Oman, I think, is very confident that the company's device business, its high-end and premium tier, 5G, Snapdragon, and technologies and licensing are all pretty robust, solid, and well entrenched. But what he's pretty continuously articulated in all of his market commentaries. He doesn't feel that it fully, what is fully appreciated is the business's diversification, which is the new routes to market, whether that's PCs, automobile, automotive, IOT. And so, um, you know, the company continues to make acquisitions that are extending sort of the way the company goes to market. And that's what made this uh, Qualcomm acquisition of Cellwise because it isn't in, in their space. It's in the RAND space, um, you know, Basically, cell uh, cell wise, you know, is in the space of five G network deployment, automation, uh, management software, and essentially, what Qualcomm is looking to do is to utilize cell wise to help with multi uh, vendor RAN automation and management, and tying it together to what Qualcomm already offers as a 
you know, leading 5G RAN platform. And so as I see it, this is an interesting new go-to-market modality for Qualcomm because they're getting closer and closer to having to work and actually uh, have the operators as customers buying. You know, they typically, their market was the ODMs, you know, and they would be like kind of this circular relationship that it would exist. Qualcomm would help the ODMs build devices. Those device makers would then work with the operators to make sure they were certified. But as Qualcomm becomes more um, integral to the actual network itself, to the RAN layer itself, these customers start to have to come to Qualcomm more and more, and they're feeding off of that relationship directly with Qualcomm, which, you know, I don't think should surprise every, anyone. You know, it's kind of like building the semiconductors um, that are going to create the automobile. You know, it used to be done by OEMs that were kind of these tier ones that lived in between the car makers and the chip makers. And now the chip makers are just working directly with all the car makers. Um, this is kind of the same thing that's happening. Qualcomm is going to be working much more closely directly with the operators um, to be able to help, you know, the, them deploy private, uh, you know, and public 5G networks at the pace that the market is expecting. So, you know, as, as I talked to uh, Durga Malati, who runs the business, and there's a pod, and I'll put it in the show notes um, that we did, you know, the long and the short was uh, that this is all about enabling the mobile network operators and enterprises to uh, monetize 5G. So, um, you know, a lot more there, but you know what, Pat, there's just a lot to cover, and I know we, uh, we only have a few minutes left, so, I'll pause there because I know you probably want to bounce back a few things, but it was a good strategic acquisition that's going to expand the company's business and it's going to expand the depths of its role in 5G. Yeah, my you sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room, but you did get the interview with Durga, so congrats. Um, what really struck me on this is this isn't hardware, right? This is automation and orchestration. Yep. And this is very different for a a Qualcomm to get it to, to get in this. In fact, I'm unaware of any application or any type of capability that even comes comes close to this. So it's one thing to be in the hardware, it's the other thing to be in the software. Qualcomm is clearly uh, creating a, a, I would say, half stack platform, right? The reason I call it half stack is you have to add the applications to be a full stack, uh, but still impressive uh, nonetheless. And I think what we've learned is that uh, uh, customers buy into solutions as opposed to a uh, bag of parts. And um, this is one step closer to that, uh, to, to that solution. So a uh, big part of uh, Qualcomm's diversification strategy, you know, it's interesting where we're seeing the company uh, not only hit the edge, but start to come in off the edge, right? So consider, you know, you have chips, you have smartphones, you have RF, that's going to be connecting uh, uh, to the base station that's gonna be connected to the RAN and now an open RAN. So there we go. Gonna be uh, watching this a lot. So Daniel, let's get into our last topic. And this is uh, Oracle earnings. I mean, basically they crushed it, right? They crushed expectations. Maybe the expectations were low, maybe they just crushed it. But listen, they beat on the top. Uh, pretty uh, pretty well and substantially beat on the bottom. Uh, the day that they closed, they were up uh, they were up twelve percent. And while a five percent boost in overall revenue isn't something uh, to necessarily write write home about, or a decline of six percent uh, in in net income, uh, the the what people were really excited about was the continued march of cloud. Right. And whether you want to, you know, if your definition of cloud is IaaS plus PaaS like Gartner, they had 19 percent growth. IaaS, right, which AWS is is known the most for, 36 percent, folks. OK. And that is nuts. And just to close out the IaaS and PaaS, you look at SaaS. You had Fusion ERP at 20 percent, NetSuite ERP at 27 percent. A clear shot across the bow to uh, uh, SAP out there. You know, notice probably the last eight or nine quarters, Daniel, uh, they keep um, uh, focusing on ERP when it comes to uh, Fusion and, uh, and and NetSuite. And then probably in the biggest array of customers I've seen them roll out, they, they rolled out, um, you know, 
two case studies for financial cloud, 24 customers they rolled out for OCI and 43 customers they, they rolled out for uh, SAPs, SAS apps. And I really do appreciate this part, this, this type of um, openness that, that Oracle provides uh, uh, in their earnings. I got to tell you, um, this is absolutely no longer a fluke. Uh, the biggest, am I surprised at their strength in SaaS? No. Am I uh, surprised in their strength in PaaS? Eh, maybe, right? But when it comes to, you know, API, if it's something storage and database, I get it. But IaaS, really? I mean, Oracle, the company that started off as a database company, had 36% growth in IaaS. <laughs> Blows me away, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, the company's got a 10 plus billion dollar cloud business now. And a lot of people were critical of Larry Allison's overtures about where he was going to take that business. But at some point, you have to say, like, that's pretty good. I mean, that's it's pretty good. Not to mention, you got 74% recurring subscription to your main core business that generates yeah. tons of profit. And in a market of instability, when I wrote my Market Watch piece about companies that are going to uh, basically be your best bets during this risk period, Oracle is like a perfect example. They got a growth engine, double digits in their SaaS and now IS space. They've got uh, products that are evolving and meaningfully improving, which you and I both said Gen 1 stunk. Gen 2 has been a, a fantastic. The autonomous products, database, that stuff has been very, very good. The NetSuite, that portfolio, it, all good. Pat, the other thing we're not really acknowledging, though, is that growth rate actually puts them on a very similar clip to Google Cloud and the recent growth from AWS. So it means they're not actually losing ground anymore. They're not necessarily gaining any ground against those bigger players, but they're actually keeping pace, which means when we always talk about that kind of overall outsized market growth, they are keeping pace of growth with the bigger cloud space. They're a player. That's, I think, where we're at right now. Are they number three? Are they number four? I think that's to be determined. But you can't continue to say, you know, just because the old Oracle isn't cool that you don't like them. You know, remember, and I, I tell people this every day, Pat, but six, seven years ago, Microsoft wasn't cool either. Yeah. There, there was a time and that was different. So is this the beginning of that kind of transformation to Oracle becoming a hot, cool, savvy company? I don't know if the landscape will open the door to that, but they're doing a lot of things right. The growth is legit. The customers they're winning are, are, are real customers and 10 plus billion in cloud revenue. Um, I'll take a piece of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it is amazing. You know, and Oracle said they were going to be big and I, you know, big and hyperscale. I was just like, there's just no way, but congrats hat, hats off to them. Be great to see a, a strong fourth, you know, number three, number four, number five. So I think right now they're sitting about four, you put in SaaS into that, they're even bigger than that. So Daniel, great show, man. It's great to see you from our undisclosed locations. Folks, not the uh, not the best uh, visual uh, here, although I hope you uh, do appreciate the jumping horse uh, over uh, my right shoulder here. So with that, I'm gonna bid adieu. Have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in. And by the way, uh, we uh, took uh, all of these 6.5 Summit videos and put them on uh, YouTube. They're unbridled. Uh, hit Twitter, LinkedIn to uh, uh, to get the, the the deets on that. But and, then, and we'll be sharing them, them, and we'll be sharing them on Spotify and, and iTunes and Apple or wherever Apple Podcasts, wherever they they're shared. We'll be drop dripping those out over the next several months as well. So yeah, uh, can't get enough, buddy. Can't get, get enough. Take care, so, everybody. Bye now.